to be about gravitational waves. So normally, of course, the gravitational wave is now an important experimental subject. It's been seen from various astrophysical sources. So it's of interest to study it more deeply, to know first about the astrophysical the astrophysical sources by them themselves. But also this gives you the experimental measurements, give you an opportunity to study the gravitational the nature of the GR waves themselves. For instance, I think that you know, the most important fundamental question about gravitational waves is that when you observe gravitational waves, <coughs> can you say something about the nature of the graviton, whether it's a quantized object or not, and for that, of course, you don't need a, the full theory of quantum gravity. I mean, if you recall from electrodynamics, we knew that photon was a quanta much before we had a QE, theory of QED. This was from, <coughs> actually, photon was, I mean, the nature of photon, that it is a quanta, was actually proved from the thermodynamics, minus 10 A and B coefficients and so on. So there are <coughs> ways to look for observables which tell you the quantum nature of your graviton without having a full theory of quantum gravity. Okay. <clears throat> so, this set of lectures, what I'll mainly cover is the following, that we already know that we have this binary radiation, that you have a binary star, they radiate gravitational waves and these are detected at this LIGO and so on. So, this, this interferometers, they can detect it okay. and this is uh, treated classically. For instance, we know that there is an Einstein quadrupole formula which tells you that the energy, for instance, the Hij is basically So you take, so this is Einstein's <clears throat> so this tells you that if you find out the quadrupole moment of this object in this binary, take the second derivative and this will be at retarded time, if you calculate it at an earlier time, then this is the gravitational wave which you will observe at LIGO. Okay. Now, if you look, there is another perspective of looking at it. In the field theory way, so this is the classical. Okay. In the field theory way, what you do is, you say that the graviton, so you linearize gravity, so you take <coughs> so there are in the classical GR what you do is you take G mu nu, this is eta mu nu plus H mu nu. So, this is your metric and that is a dimensionless object okay. <coughs> and that tells you basically the strain that you observe here. Okay. So, this is dimensionless whereas, <coughs> in the quantum treatment you think of this as a spin 2 field and its mass dimension is 1. 
So for that, you expand it with the coupling parameter. And this is done so that you recover your Einstein's equation, uh, <coughs> your Einstein's equation in the linearized limit. And in this picture, your interaction is this kappa times h mu nu times the t mu nu, the stress tensor of this guy, this object. So then the picture is like, there is a, so you can reduce this binary to a one body going around a center of force. Okay. So there is a center of force which is deflecting this binary and <coughs> During the deflection, it emits a graviton. And you then do this calculation you, as you normally do for calculating, for instance, the Bremster lung from a charged particle. And <coughs> you will see that this, uh, what you get here, is what you get in, in this treatment. Okay, so, so far, so any tree level. quantum calculations give you the same as the classical result. So the purpose of this calculation is just to get your normalization right and say that okay, the formalism works in the quantum treatment. Okay. <coughs> this one. Here you, you actually, okay, so basically what you do is you this is the Einstein equation in the linearized limit. I'll do this. T mu nu and some g, right? <coughs> then you write the Green's function for this operator. And this h mu nu is basically Green's function times t over the volume. Yeah, yeah. So, so far it is identical, but <clears throat> there are many processes where you, I mean, so it's obviously identical. I mean, it's just doing the same thing in the Fourier space. But <clears throat> as I said, in many places, this is much more simple to do. And then <clears throat> there are certain things like memory theorems and so on, which come out very easily in this formalism than here. So I'll devote that next section to the <clears throat> Yeah. These, uh, why, why, why did I expect the yeah, single gravity to be emitted? I could have expected that these are massive objects, so there will be lots of. Yes, them. yes. So you will have a picture of this kind. And so on. Yeah, <coughs> you have to sum over them. But it was, works out that other than there is a collinear limit where there is a divergence, a summation is not needed. <coughs> okay? So a summation is only required when there is a divergence in the zero graviton forward emission limit. Otherwise, the linear order gives you exactly the same formula that you get here. So for practical calculations, this is good enough. Okay. And <clears throat> the other thing is that in this way of doing, okay, this is we do a multipole expansion of this one by so this Green's function is in the one upon I'll write this So this is the Green's function of x prime and x. Okay. So what you do is you do a multipole expansion of this here, which works if there are your x is x prime is smaller than x. That means you have resources which are confined. And here x prime is smaller than t prime. That means it's a slow moving. You can do another expansion. Okay. So for confined sources which are slow moving, you have a quadrupole formula, which works. Okay. On the other hand, if you have a fast source, so if you have a scattering of big objects, a hyperbolic encounter, so it's not a merger, but a hyperbolic encounter, and if they are not confined sources, and if they are relativistic, then you cannot make this quadruple infinite. In that case, what you get is what, you, what is coming out, coming out as a memory signal. Then instead of this oscillation, you get a step function. So the step function is a characteristic of relativistic sources. 
okay and this memory in particular is very easy to calculate using this uh, Feynman rules the memory signal so that <coughs> compared to when you do this expansions <coughs> okay so radiation yeah yeah yes you separate it into a yeah the near zone and the radiation zone and you calculate the field in the radiation zone so then you can make this approximations and <coughs> so this is the standard things which are calculated and as you said you can see through it that it's exactly the same as your tree level but when you have a fast source okay then these calculations still continue to be the same because these are the relativistic calculations of memory <coughs> okay so so this is the overall picture and the next thing where this is useful i mean in, in practical calculations is that in your dark matter you can now treat graviton as one of the propagators or external legs and do practical calculations of relic density and so on for instance you can have some dark matter so let us say this is your inflaton and this is your dark matter so you can have production of dark matter by scattering of inflaton or by yeah, <coughs> collision of inflaton in the early universe and then they freeze out and you will get a relic density uh, <coughs> so this dark matter so these are also now relevant models because i mean this could always be done this need not have waited for observations of gravitational waves <coughs> because this just follows the field theory of gravitons <coughs> also you can have things like you know for instance one interesting thing is sorry uh, okay i'll give you an another example so in neutrino physics you will know this example where you have a coupling between so the neutrino mass has a right nr and ul so you have a direct neutrino mass which couples a, a sterile neutrino with your left handed active neutrinos okay and these sterile neutrinos can so this is achieved by this coupling h y <coughs> okay now this will give you a diagram which is like a heavy neutrino in the early universe will decay into this and this its anti particle will decay into the anti neutrino and this and you can arrange things such that the neutrino decay and the anti neutrino decay have a small difference which will give you a leptogenesis so this is a very standard leptogenesis calculation okay. now what you can have is you can have a bremsstrahl lung of a graviton the same story which was here but now from one of the external legs okay here or this one so what does that give you yeah here this one no so sorry this one here is your graviton these are any this is a scalar this is called a, the inflaton and this is a, it could be a fermi no it's a, your dark matter so normally when you do a relic density calculation you say well early some particles were there which produced dark matter or standard model particles produced dark matter and at some point they froze out and you have dark matter left over so normally this graviton was not used as a mediator but you can now and you have good theories for such things yeah what is the what what is the mediator i couldn't hear you what is the mediator ah for the second picture okay good question 
So here the first diagram is just this vertex, this one. So you have a phi, you have a n and you have a nu. So there is no mediator. It's a vertex diagram. Then what you can do is, is you can attach a graviton to the external leg. Okay. And now what this means that in this decay, some of the energy can go into the graviton. Okay. So what this gives you is that <coughs> this will give you stochastic gravitational waves from early universe. <coughs> and so can this kind of things where you have an external graviton leg. So now you have ex gravitational waves which are produced by elementary particles in the early universe and they are your stochastic background the kind of which is seen in pulsar arrays, nanograv and so on. So now for this calculation, I mean you can do the full calculation but it's a two minute job to do it using memory theorems. A soft graviton, so this is just you calculate the <coughs> amplitude of this process without the graviton and then with a the multiplicative factor it is giving you the amplitude with the graviton. So these calculations are very easy to do using the memory of uh, the soft theorems. Yeah. Yeah. How how is what? Yeah, yeah. So, so this will be the conjugate of this. So, what you will get is you will get a left-handed uh, sterile and a right-handed antineutrino. And if your this thing is a complex number, it's not, then you will get the two rates which are different. In fact, the square of that thing will give you the same. It's the interference term which gives you the linear order. And so, what I'm saying is that the standard calculations which we do normally do in our particle physics, <coughs> we can now attach these gravitons and use the soft theorems to do this calculation and they predict how much is the stochastic gravitational wave which is coming out. <coughs> okay. And so the stochastic gravitational wave, okay, I'll, okay, so this class, I'll just give a summary overview <coughs> And then I'll do the some elementary boring calculations where you don't guys don't <laughs> because <coughs> that is just laborious. <coughs> so I'll give you the overall picture and then the next class I'll do this which has some novelty. So there is some use to listen to that. <coughs> okay, so the stochastic gravitational wave calculation is that you have this normally in this kind of thing, you have a gravitational wave and it's coming one gravitational wave is emitted in the one en encounter here and these oscillate and you see a signal. So you, <coughs> whereas what happens here is that you have many gravitational waves from all directions and you have these pulsars, let's say you have this earth and you have these pulsars all around. Okay, And this distance is like say kiloparsec and the inverse of the kiloparsec is 10 to the 9 hertz. <coughs> Sorry. No. 10 to the 9 hertz, right? Nano hertz. Something like that. <coughs> okay. So, what happens is that if you have gravitational waves of this size, of kiloparsec size, which are coming from early universe. Okay. And so, basically, if you have some set of gravitational waves <coughs> and they have some, what will happen is that statistically these, these things will oscillate when the gravitational wave passes through. So what you do is you look for the arrival time. This is supposing the normal arri arrival time of the pulses coming from some pulse A, pulsar A. Okay. Then when a gravitational wave passes through, there will be a shift. 
like that. Okay, so there will be some delta t by t. Okay, which will happen here. Then you look at the same quantity from the second pulsar and take a correlation over some time like 10 years. So this delta T A by delta T A angular correlation between two different things will depend upon the angle between them. Assuming there is isotropy, there is no overall direction. Then this will be some function which we call C theta times the some function which depends upon the amplitude and here this function theta this is a interesting object it's called the hellings down curve so the way it looks is that this is theta where this is theta is 0 around 90 and, and this is 180 okay so what it means is that even if there is no single wave which is passing statistically this has the structure of a gravitational wave which is passing through this all, all the pulsars together so <coughs> the pulsars which are 180 degrees apart okay they have the same there is a positive correlation they move together inward same or outward together whereas the ones which are 90 degree apart when the gravitational wave passes okay if this some one pulse uh, one is here one moves in and the other moves out okay so there is a negative correlation and then 180 degree positive zero positive if they are same direction that is positive okay so this captures the picture of your statistical average of gravitational waves which are passing through and it has the <coughs> i mean there is a this calculation has to go through but <coughs> it overall gives you the same thing as a single gravitational wave which is passing through all the pulsars and this is what was observed in this nanograph that they saw some <coughs> so now it is of interest to calculate this number for various events predict and see what you can predict for pulsars so this also i will do in detail in one of the classes okay <coughs> And I think one last thing which I I want to I plan to do is <coughs> the phase transitions. So here what happens is that you have this potential. So at zero temperature, you have some, <coughs> let's say, you have this kind of potential. And then as you raise the temperature, the potential develops a barrier and there is a new minima. And then there is a transition from here to here. Okay, And if this minima is lower than that earlier then the energy is released as gravitational, part of the energy is released as gravitational waves. And that's the same type of stochastic gravitational waves, which you see from that. And those also you will see, so this you will also see in LISA. This has higher wavelengths, uh, this frequency, so you, one can see in LISA also. So this is uh, one of the things I'll do. The calculation of this effective potentials at finite temperature. So this will have nothing to do with gravitational waves as such, but it is, uh, I think, uh, for particle physics an interesting thing. And one of the byproducts is that during this transition, the tunneling, you will have a gravitational waves reduced. So this is, oh, and I, as I said here, <coughs> this soft graviton. and this memory so, 
so this is overall what i'll do so probably i'll just uh, so i'm here two weeks so maybe alternate days one class Ah. So, uh, so any process can be just like that. Right? So, so the process, is, the particles have to be. The energy should be such that it should be observable. In your from you have this pulsar PTA to LIGO. In this, so there is a gravitational wave ready to emitted whose frequency depends upon the energy it has got, and then it dilutes, red shifts, and you have to observe this. So it should be experimentally interesting. It should fall in one of the experimental observable things like LISA, PTA, <coughs> or so, LIGO. So, the first was ah, so what, that process, even if you don't observe anything, it's a portal for giving you a relic density of a dark matter, which is different from the WIMP scenario. <coughs> so that also, I mean, works that you could have a. Pre yeah. So WIMP thing was that you have this, uh, yeah. At the weak interaction, it they decoupled, but they did not have it decoupled the weak interaction. They could have decoupled at the time of inflation, very high energy. In which case, the mediator could be gravitons. So. And the second one is essentially like it's like some sort of it's basically the 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 electrical resistance. Yeah. So what happens is that we have very heavy neutrinos, 10 to the 13 GeV. When the temperature goes below this, they will decay and the backward decay. <coughs> and then at that time, if you have graviton emission, okay, then those gravitons will have a very high frequency, which will dilute, and then you will see it in the LISA redshift and so on. So those diagrams are generic, but the numbers have to be such that it should be in an observable place. Yeah. No, no, leptogenesis doesn't need the graviton. Ga graviton accompanies leptogenesis. During leptogenesis, one of the particles which are, there is a Bremsstrahl lung of graviton from one of the external legs. Small? Ah, so, okay, so that is an interesting point. So, for leptogenesis, you have one amplitude and there should be a small, this thing, so there is a difference of the direct process, sorry, the lepton and the anti-lepton, there should be a very small difference. But each of them could be large. Here what happens, both the leptons and the anti-leptons, they emit gravitons equally. And for the graviton emission doesn't matter, the CP violation part doesn't matter. <coughs> okay, so you could have a graviton emission from both processes. And Okay. In spiral region, yes. So I'm, I'm, I didn't say it is. Yeah, yeah. So what happens is, as you go closer, as it goes faster and faster, you have to have higher and higher multiples. You know, so and also higher and higher orders of use by C, post Newtonian. And then at some point, I think this thing becomes this uh, graviton thing becomes uh, this h less than one doesn't work. Okay, the amplitude becomes large. And then I think the numerical relativity is what, what is used, but I am not an expert there. This one. <coughs> this one is done for, yeah, this gives you the correct signal, but the merger, when it happens at the end, it doesn't cover at that point, but it gives you the correct signal up till the merger. So the merger happens actually six short child radius away. That's when we, what you call the merger. <coughs> So, okay. So this is the overall picture, and I'll <coughs> the premium version st starts next class. So this one will be a very boring thing. So you guys can, I mean, don't need not waste your time. But <coughs> anyway, you can stay. Okay. So today I'm going to start. Uh, I'll I'll just cover <coughs> GR. For those of you who are, Sudhir told me that this is, should be a very elementary class for beginners, so I will.
Okay. Okay, so I'll do this uh, general relativity and today the standard geometrical picture where I don't use a gra graviton propagator <coughs> but treat uh, this gravity as a I mean a geometrical concept. So <coughs> there are two things which you need to build your theory of gravity. One is equivalence principle and the second thing is a invariance under a transformation. So I will just show that these two things will give you your standard picture of GR. So <clears throat> what equivalence principle tells you is that that in any dynamical situation where you have a let's say point mass falling in a gravitational field okay, you can it is possible to choose a reference frame in which no gravity locally. So let me explain what that means. What that means is that let's say you have object falling okay, and you are this is the earth. Okay. So it is it is going to accelerate but you, if you frame it in a falling elevator okay, and you attach a reference frame here xi mu so now from the reference frame of the elevator this thing is not going to accelerate it's going to have a inertial motion okay so in the xi system <coughs> coordinates Okay. Let's say this object has xi mu, xi is the coordinate system and xi mu is the coordinates of this particular object. This has <coughs> the equation of motion xi mu square by xi d tau square 0 and here this d tau square is let's say sorry I'll write it in is I zero square okay so this is the invariant amplitude sorry the invariant interval in the xi coordinates and that has no gravity so this is just like your Minkowski it is actually Minkowski locally not okay I'll explain what locally means a little later <coughs> right now locally means only at that point not in the neighborhood okay. for neighborhood you need a different coordinates the same coordinates no will not cover <coughs> so this practically means that you take this out and you are left with 1 minus V of xi0. So d tau basically means your proper time in the xi is this coordinate. Okay. 
Now you observe the same thing from an earth coordinate system. So I will call that x and the same point I will call x mu. Okay. So having defined this then what I say is the equation of motion of this xi mu looks like that. Okay. Because it's a straight line motion. So now we can transform this to x mu coordinates. Okay, the same equation. Now I go to the x mu coordinates. So what is needed for that? What you do is you measure in the xi mu coordinates the trajectory, you measure in the x mu coordinates the trajectory and infer from that a relation between x mu and xi mu. Okay. So you should know a <coughs> coordinate transformation from x mu to xi mu, a relation between x mu and xi mu for this particular object. Okay. Once you do that, then <coughs> d tau square is remains the same. So d tau square is actually false. Oh, okay. So I'll just say, I will not write the metric yet. I have not. I don't have a metric. D tau remains the same in x coordinates. So I'll use that. Okay. Now I just transform this equation and so for that I need a little algebra. So the algebra is here. First write So this is the tau of xi mu, but it is also the same as the tau of x coordinates. So you can use it there and use the chain rule. And this you will get from this relation that you have made a coordinate transformation. Okay. Apply a d by d tau again and do some algebra. So. Okay, so let me So to calculate that, I use this to write it like that and then I differentiate in by part in and this is going to be what have I done? I think I wrote this wrong. Yeah, sorry. I'm calculating this num, this thing. Okay. So I calculated the first derivative. I calculate the second derivative. Okay. <coughs> and then this I write as, and this is actually equal to zero. So that's this. Okay. So then.
and that is 0. And now operate with So, in this equation, operate with this, which means basically multiply this and it implies a summation over mu, sum over all terms. Okay. And then this gives you, and use the fact that use this chain rule okay. and use this chain rule and what you will get is so from the second term you will get d square x is of this will come from this term and this term will give you the first term will give you I think it will give you this. So, this is going to come from this term. I hope so. Okay, you can check if I made a mistake, but the procedure is this. Okay. And with that, what you do is you say that you define a new object and this is called a Christopher connection take by absorbing the coefficients, these coefficients. So, this is So, with, so in the end, what we get from this, uh, you can <coughs> check the algebra leisurely. <coughs> An equation of this kind that d square x rho upon d tau square plus okay. so this gives you what's called the geodesic equation in the so what happens is that in the x frame it's no longer a straight line motion the second derivative is not zero so you get some other effect. So, now you can see that without introducing the metric, okay, 
Okay, yeah, you can, yeah, certainly. So what I meant by straight line is second derivative is not zero. The standard straight, yeah, it's straight line, of course, the geodesic. So this is the straight line, basically, that's what you're saying. Okay, why did Yeah. So what we did was that basically, we have a coordinate transformation, which without having to introduce a metric, <coughs> you can see that the effect of your, your dynamics is captured in a coordinate transformation. So if you know the transformation between the free fall frame and a fixed frame, then you can write the equation of motion. Okay, you can do this, calculate this using the coordinate transformation and you will get the dynamics in the fixed frame. Okay, so this didn't have to go through the metric. Okay, so <coughs> this gives us what is the metric? This is eta mu nu. And as I said, this remains invariant. So this allows me to define beta, where So, these coordinates, if you change the coordinates, go from these coordinates to these coordinates and say that your metric, your invariant interval remains the same, then this defines your metric. So, this basically, this term So, you can see that all the things that so far we have seen are that you have a metric which is given in terms of coordinate transformation. I mean, if you know the relation between the two coordinates, calculate the metric, calculate the Christopher connection, <coughs> and you can calculate the dynamics. Okay. All right. And <coughs> then, of course, <coughs> So now you say, well, okay, once you have a metric, we can just relate this guy to this guy without having to do a coordinate transformation. Can we write this guy in terms of that guy? So that is also possible then. So that is basically, I will not go through the So this is your standard this thing for connecting crystal connection with the metric. Okay. So here you didn't have to go through an inertial frame. You can directly say that for a metric, knowing a metric, you can calculate the connection. So the next thing I'll come to. Okay, so there is a Newtonian limit, but that is trivial, so I'll <coughs> okay I can. So how many of you are actually seeing this for the first time? Only two. Okay, maybe I'll give you. <coughs> so the Newtonian limit of your metric, for instance, you can write it as 1 plus 2 phi. I'll go through it. Okay. 
sine squared. So this is the metric around a point mass. And this phi is what's called the Newtonian potential G m by r. And this approximation works. Oh, okay, I think this is correct. This is still. But you expand this and keep things linearly in phi to linear order in phi, then this will only work. Of course, this when this phi is less than one. Okay. Huh? There will be a minus. This one? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this one phi is positive, one phi is negative. Or you can make this like that. Hmm? Okay. Okay, then this is positive, correct. All right. So then <coughs> I hope uh, my signs are. Your only component of Christopher connection, if you calculate using this metric, which is non-zero, is half so this is your H00, if you expand the metric, and these are these HIJs. So the only component which matters is this H00. Okay. And then So the geodesic equation for a particle around a point mass And again, as I said, d tau square here is basically dt square 1 minus v square. <coughs> so this the, what do you call where this is the what do you call the Lorentz factor. And so this gives you gamma square. And there should be a there is a <coughs> gamma square from this. D tau is dx zero. So when I write this tau in terms of t, I'll get a one this gamma factor, and dx zero by dt is one. That's right. T. So basically, this these two gamma factors cancel, and this is your equation of motion for acceleration around a Newtonian this thing, which you get from the geodesic equation. <coughs> okay. So we have a connection. Now I will, yeah. I will. So this is a very. I mean, there are a lot more to be said about all of these things. But I am just giving you a quick survey of GR. So now I will introduce 
the Riemann tensor, but in in a practical way. So, so what the Riemann tensor tells you is how the if you have two, as I said, in a falling elevator, okay, each point is a you can make metric around this point 0 and the metric around that point 0 okay but so you will need two separate coordinate systems for nearby points okay why because the earth's gravitational <coughs> will pull everything towards the center so they are actually they will actually approach either each other so each of them is traversing a geodesic but they are going to be approaching each other okay so you cannot remove if you calculate the <coughs> geodesic deviation which means how much these geodesics deviate from each other relative that cannot be removed by a choice of coordinates okay yeah it cannot see equivalence principle tells you that it guarantees that there is always a point where you can make it zero okay here it tells you you cannot there will be situations where this cannot be done of course there will be times when there is uniform acceleration in one direction when the Riemann tensor is zero in that case it is possible but there is no guarantee that you will always choose a frame you can choose a frame where you can eliminate this relative acceleration between two masses <coughs> so i mean if there is a you know near the surface of the earth what you in high higher secondary we call g okay that is uniform acceleration they are not so there they are not the Riemann tensor we are treating it as zero the tidal force we are treating it as zero <coughs> but if you took, take the earth moon system then the distance is long enough then the tidal forces matter okay so there is <coughs> whereas equivalence principle tells you that no matter what the gravitational field in general this will always be possible to choose a frame okay where you can remove the gravity locally and in more mathematical terms what it means is that you can always choose a frame where the Christopher connection goes to zero but what will turn out is that the derivative of the Christopher connection cannot be made zero and that's related to the Riemann tensor Okay, so you can make a function zero but not its derivative and okay <coughs> so so we are going to observe two uh, two geodesics and this there is a point which is moving in time and this tau is the parameter <coughs> which tells you the progress of this particle along the geodesic and this epsilon is the separation between these two particles in the nearby derivative uh, geodesics okay so So we have so this is called just okay. Now choose your coordinate system along on this to make things simple. in the x tau this is the particle x tau reference rest frame so your particle is moving here and your coordinate system with which you are measuring both this and that are from this okay, so here is your coordinate system in that case we know that
So that is the first thing. In its own coordinate system, it is not x. It is a straight line motion and in that frame, so this Christopher connection, this remains 0 along the trajectory of x tau for the x tau particle. Okay. Now we find out Sorry, I, I should write now the So this is the geodesic for the y particle, okay? And <clears throat> you take this. So this is y of tau. Let's say and expand it in the x frame. So what you say is. and higher orders of epsilon. So I did a Taylor expansion of this y connection on the in the x reference frame and kept the first order. Okay. <coughs> and now of course this is zero. Okay. Because, <coughs> because our coordinate system is located here. But this derivative is not zero. So this will give you a non-zero term. So what you get is <coughs> sorry. Yeah. So what you do now is you can write this as y is x plus epsilon. Second derivative of the x is zero. So that will just leave you with second derivative of the epsilon and expanding this what what you will get here is well I did So I expanded y here, also expanded y along around x, and since I already have a order epsilon term here, I kept the zeroth order epsilon terms here. Okay, so that just gives you this x. Okay. So this is what's called the geodesic deviation equation. That means even if you have so if you have two the separation between the geodesic in general will change and that will depend upon the derivative of this connection. So sometimes of course if you engineer things such that the connection is a constant then of course this is zero but in general it is not guaranteed to be zero whereas in equivalence principle tells you that second derivative in the x coordinate is guaranteed to be zero. Okay. <clears throat> so this is called the geodesic deviation.
and I think I'll just How much time do I have? Over? Okay. I think then I'll stop. <clears throat> so, okay. So, what I've done is, uh, I think I'll just write the Riemann tensor in this. So, the point of this was to introduce uh, <clears throat> something. So, there is one more step where I have to write the Riemann tensor, which I'll do later. But, there is a Riemann tensor, which is our new So I'll write that next time that this equation when written covariantly gives you here a Riemann tensor okay? and so I'll just write down that equation where Okay, so this is called the, and it's two few steps more from there. So here, what had happened was that we took a special point where to make things simple, where this gamma was zero along one point. But if you don't take it to be zero, you take all the terms, gamma in both the terms, then do the same thing. What you end up with is this thing given by there. Okay, so. This was an important equation for settling this question of our GW real. <coughs> so the th thing is, we say that G mu nu is eta mu nu plus H mu nu. Okay? And this is your gravitational wave. And we also said that you can equivalence principle guarantees that you can always choose a frame where this is G, it, eta mu nu is zero. That means G mu nu is eta mu nu. So if you measure something, is it a measurable quantity? Because it's something which you can always choose a frame where this goes away. Okay. So even Einstein was confused. I mean, I shouldn't say confused, but he had he vacillated, and. <coughs> He took the wrong position that this is a gauge, this gravitational waves are gauge artifact. That means you can always choose a frame where this is different. Whereas in the end, the equation was that settled this was this. So you now we have this thing that if you have a bead and a gravitational wave passes through, nearby points will always <coughs> separate, okay, governed by this equation. And this is not guaranteed to be zero. So this is not zero. You cannot choose a reference frame. This is zero. Okay. So this is really when you calculate the H R mu nu from this, that tells you that these points will move either in this direction or in this direction, depending on your gauge. No, sorry, the type of gravitational wave which passes through. 
<coughs> so it's a remand tensor which guarantees that your GW are real and this was actually done very late in the game Pirani in 1960s <coughs> okay so I'll do yeah what is the ah so this ah, I, I have to so if you take I have not introduced many terms which I will do alpha epsilon u this is I am calling d by e. So this is called parallel transport means you take a some vector okay take its covariant derivative and along a particular geodesic yeah so this is what's called the parallel transport of a vector and this if you use that then this equation gives you the correct uh, covariant so there was some algebra which I'll maybe do later. <coughs> okay, so this was so uh, today I'll stop here, right? It's I think it should. Yeah, yeah that's enough. Okay, so this goes a lot slower than I imagined. So I <coughs> anyway from so next class will be. Uh, Day after tomorrow? Okay, so next class will be day after tomorrow here at 2.30. And now I will jump into GW with a little, yeah, I think I'll just complete this. And <coughs> I will jump to gravitational waves and various aspects of looking at them. So this was basically an introduction to general relativity today's action. Thank you. Okay, thank you.